from this committee. Okay, again, if you have any questions, go ahead and either put it in the Zoom chat, um, or if you, know, if you don't have a microphone, and if you do have a microphone and you wanna ask, go ahead and just uh, unmute and ask your question, please. Uh, when is the, uh, are the module two homework due? Uh, currently, that, I was just gonna talk about that. Currently, they're due on Wednesday at midnight. Oh, well, I think it says Monday right now. Uh, on the original email, it did say Monday, but I have moved it to Wednesday. Well, let me double check that. Um, there. No, it's still Monday, it says for me. Okay, it still says Monday. Let me go ahead and change that right now. I might have to push it because um, I just want to do our activity as well. We have a nomenclature activity we're doing next week that'll help solidify most of this chapter two together. Uh, let's see, this is organic chemistry. And, because the chapter 2.2 homework shouldn't be due until Friday. But let me go ahead and see that right now before I, uh, it says September 7th, which is Monday, is it not? Yep. Okay, so you are correct. I need to change that to September 9th. All right, let me do that right now before I forget. I'm gonna unassign and I'm gonna assign to all students for homework from now through September 9th at 11.59 p.m. All right, it is correctly assigned through Wednesday and then the 2.2 assignment uh, is not going to be due until Friday. And I will assign that right now. Uh, till September 11th at 11.59. PM, thank you, that uh, assignment. All right, so that brings us to our administration. Uh, so uh, obviously you will get a new link next week and also there uh, by email, and I will also put it in the announcements. We do not have class on Monday. Uh, if you show up, I won't. Uh, I'll be recording videos, and so uh, I'll have um, uh, plenty to do there. Uh, so most of you have joined Top Hat and have uh, started doing homework. I see a lot of homework grades pouring in, so that's great. Uh, so we're going to continue with chapter module two today, and we'll start module 2.2 uh, next week sometime. That's why the module 2.2, which is IR spectroscopy. Uh, oh, and, and Nick says there are no SI uh, or office hours on Monday either because it's a holiday. Right. Uh, um, if, if you do have SI on Monday, feel free to go on a different day if you do want that reinforcement after outside of lecture. But um, I can't have a session on Monday. I apologize. Yeah. So anyway, so but uh, use that as, you know, uh, catch up or look at some videos. We'll see what's happening with that. OK, uh, I believe that's all the administration I have. Um, and so we'll continue on with chapter two. Uh, we had just finished talking about alkanes and how to name alkanes and trying to get to our longest chain and to, you know, kind of what they were and how their names changed with stuff. And then that gave us to, a, brought us up to a really good break point, which was cycloalkanes. So cycloalkanes, like the name suggests, just means it's an alkane, meaning it's all carbons and hydrogens. All the carbons are sp3 hybridized and they're all tetrahedral. However, they're now in a circle. Okay, so to do that, when we do that, we actually change the number of hydrogens we have in our general formula because we basically took a long chain, clipped a hydrogen off each side, and bonded those two carbons together. So what we see here is that our formula has changed. Our regular straight chain alkanes was Cn H2n plus two. So we have those two on the ends of the chain. So this is the straight chain hydrocarbons. These are the cyclics right here. It has that generalized formula there. And you know it's a cyclic because you use the word cyclo in the name. Okay, so let's go ahead and start looking at the different rules. We're gonna to add to the rules we already used 
uh, for the regular straight chain alkanes, we're going to use some new rules for the cycloalkanes. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So just like in the case of a branched straight chain hydrocarbon, the parent is the one with the higher number of carbons. Okay. So even if you have a cyclic structure in it, if it has fewer carbons than the longest chain, then it becomes a substituent. So in the case of the one here on the left, my left, uh, we have a chain that's only three carbons long and we have a ring that's six carbons long. If this, this is larger, so this is our parent. And so we're gonna name the parent cyclohexane. And then we're gonna put that substituent in that number one position, okay? So in that case, uh, we don't have to put one because if we only have one substituent, that's the only place it can be because the rings are circular. There's no, the, 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 the substituent is actually defining your first starting point. Okay. So, but in the case, if your uh, cyclic compound is smaller than the parent chain, then you name it as a substituent. And in this case, we're naming the parent chain, we're numbering the parent chain one, two, three, four, so the substituent will be on the slowest carbon. So we must use this one dash cyclopropyl because remember the YL means it's a substituent. So cyclopropyl and then butane is the parent chain. Okay, so does that make sense? We're gonna name it for how many carbons are in the ring, just like we would do hexyl or heptyl or octyl. So if we have eight carbons in a chain, it'll be cyclooctane. So that kind of uh, the parent numbering system works for both cyclics and straight chains. Okay. Now, if you have more than one substituent, now you try to number it from the lowest number possible. So for example, if we only had one methyl and this ethyl group over here, we would name it from the lowest substituent possible. Okay. Now in the case of this one, we actually have two methyls here. So we, if we have that third identifier, or that third substituent there, we try to get the three substituents in their lowest structure possible. So in that case, we would start numbering from the methyl and the methyl because we have two groups that would have a number one, and then our ethyl group would be on the number three. We wouldn't name it the other way around, even though we start with ethyl because of alphabetization, we would end up with two substituents with a number three on it. Okay, so we don't number it that way. Okay. And remember, when we do our alphabetization, we do not use di, tri, tetra for our system. So our correct name is going to be the 3 dash ethyl, 1, 1, dimethyl for these two, cyclohexane. Okay. So it's the same rule. We just want to make sure because rings, you can go around both ways. You have to number them both ways to make sure that you're getting the lowest set possible, the lowest number set possible. Okay, so that brings us up to, that's just a single ring, but it's very possible to have two rings in a system. And we call these bicyclic compounds or two cycles, okay? So it's not a bicycle compound, it's a bicyclic compound, okay? So when we have a bicyclo compound, we actually name it for the number of carbons that are in both of those rings. And that becomes our parent hydrocarbon, okay? So in the case of this substituent here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in this bicyclo compound. So we're gonna name it bicycloheptane because we have seven carbons in that ring structure, okay? Now, because we have a unique condition in the bicyclo compounds, we actually have two different types of carbons in our ring, okay? And so the two different types of carbon in our ring is what we have, what we call bridge heads, and that's where we have three different carbon groups coming together to form a, a, a junction and we call those bridge heads right here, which means the other carbons are what we call bridges, okay? So 
the other, these two carbons, this carbon, and, and these two carbons here, are bridges that attach to the bridge heads. Okay, so it would be very difficult to say, well, you know, which ring is better? Is it the six-membered ring or the five-membered ring, and how do I name it? So that's why we came up with the bicyclo nomenclature, where we have the bicycloheptane, tells us the total number of carbons. But now we have a numbering system that tells us how many carbons are in each bridge, okay? So you don't count the bridges, bridge heads when you're looking at this number. You count the number of carbons in the bridge. So let's look at uh, this in a little more detail. So if we start with this bridge head right here, and we go around this side right here, we have one, two carbons before it hits the other bridge head, okay? So there's two carbons in this bridge, okay? So, and if we go up from here, we go up in this direction here, try that. We only have one carbon in that bridge head. Sorry, in that bridge. And if we go the other direction, going this way, we have one, two, we have two carbons in that bridge. Okay, so up to now, we've been trying to get our lowest number possible and, and do things in alphabetical order. In bicyclo compounds, we actually use the two largest the largest numbers first in decreasing order because the first two large numbers will tell us our largest ring in the bicyclo compound so in the case of naming this bicyclo compound because we had a two bridge head a two bridge head and a one bridge head we actually can indicate how many carbons are in each of those bridges and so we say a bracket two dot two dot, so this two is for this bridge, this two is for that bridge, and this last one is for the last bridge, okay? So whenever we draw these bicyclo compounds, it's kind of easy to draw two carbons and then going to a bridge head, two carbons going to a bridge head, and then try to figure out how to put one carbon over that last bridge head, okay? So, what if we had an uneven number of bridge, bridge carbons, okay? So let's look at how we would name that, okay? So in this case here, let's just talk about the bridges again. Uh, and I'm gonna do them in blue here. So we have one, two carbons in this bridge. We have one carbon in this bridge. And we have one, two, three carbons in this bridge, okay? because we're just looking at bridge carbons, not bridge head carbons. So that means our numbers we're gonna use for this are gonna be three because of this one, two because it's the next biggest one, and one. So that's where our numbers and brackets come from. Okay, but now we have a substituent on our material. So now we have to figure out how to number our rings. And we have a nice, a nice uh, method for doing this, we always start at one bridge head and go around the largest bridge first, then the second largest bridge, and then the third largest bridge. So if you can imagine, we start at a bridge head and then going around the longest path possible and then incorporate the last bridge into our numbers. So let's see how we do that. So in this case, we're starting with this uh, carbon right here. And since this is our three bridge, this is our two bridge, and this is our one bridge, we have to start numbering from that bridge head through the bridge, two, three, four, and five. Notice that five, we're numbering that because it is a ring, it is a carbon in the hydrocarbon system, and it's not in, denoted in this, it's just telling us a location. So if we had something attached to that, that would be the five carbon in the ring. It's not part of the number of bridges. And then we would go around our next biggest ring. And in this case, it would go around the two bridge here, which gives us a six and a seven. Now, we do not renumber our number one, okay? Now we go to, we jump over our bridge head and go to our remaining carbons. And in this case, that leaves us one last carbon on this number one bridge, okay? So we have a total of eight carbons in our ring system. So that's giving us bicyclooctane, okay? We have a methyl group attached to it. 
and it happens to be attached to the smallest bridge, which means it's going to have a fairly high number. That's the first place we can put it because we must label through the largest bridge first, the second largest bridge second, and since it's on the smallest bridge, it actually is gonna have a very high number. In this case, it's gonna be eight dash methyl, the bicyclooctane, because we have eight carbons in that firing system. And then we have a bridge with three carbons, a bridge with two carbons, and a bridge with one carbon, giving us our last name. Okay, questions on that? Okay, it kind of follows the rule of trying to find the longest parent, then find the next longest substituent, you know, so we're kind of following, we want to follow that rule of the biggest bridge first, second biggest bridge, and then third biggest bridge. Okay, let's see. Okay, okay. so that is uh, the last of the rules for cyclic compounds, okay? If it's the biggest uh, carbon chain and it's the cyclic, it's the parent. If it's not the biggest carbon chain and it's the cyclic, it's a substituent. When you have bicyclo compounds, you name it for the total number of carbons you have, but you have to identify each, the number of carbons in each bridge. Ah, what if two bridges are the same? That's a great question. And the rule is you still go through, if you have something where you have two bridges that are the same, okay, now you want to put the substituent on the lowest number, okay? So let's, for example, put this uh, methyl group right here on this bridge, okay? So let's follow all our rules correctly here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven carbons. So we have bicycloheptane, bicyclo. Okay, and we have a two carbons in this bridge, two carbons in that bridge, and two, one carbon in this bridge. So that's a 2.2.1 two bicyclo, uh, seven carbons, heptane. Okay. And now we have to start numbering from one of our bridge heads through one of the largest bridges. And so since this is the same as this, we can go numbering around either one of those bridges. But now we fall back to that rule of trying to get the lowest number on our substituent. So that means we should probably number it from this bridge head here, because it doesn't matter which bridge head you start at, you just have to start at a bridge head and put two, three, four, five, six, and then the last one would be seven, okay? So that would put our methyl group on the two position. So we would end up with two methyl, methyl, bicyclo, two, two, one, heptane, okay? Great question. Does that answer your question? All right, great. So um, hadn't thought about that. That was a great example. I like that. All right. So, so now we've done all the alkanes we can do. And now we need to move on to things that don't only have that sp3 hybridized carbons. And so what we call those, because that changes the nature of the carbon chain, we now can't call it an alkane anymore. We have to change it to an alkene. Okay. So an alk, yes, somebody raise their hand. Okay, sorry, back to the example you just did. When you were um, labeling the bridges, why did you not label like the bottom one that goes across? Like when you labeled the one that's four, five, three, and you, you labeled the two on the side and then the one on top? All right, um, uh, let me see, ask that question again. Why did I label the, on, yeah. the one on the left or the one on the right? So why is there not a bridge on the bottom? Uh, why is there not a bridge on the bottom? Uh, on the, 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 the structure drawn in blue or the structure drawn in black? The blue structure. Okay. So um, let's see. So we have, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. The structure that I drew was this. And oh, so why isn't this seven carbon drawn down? No, so, so 
you labeled like the the two on the left and then the two on the right and then the one on the top and those are your bridges right right those are the number of bridge carbons yes so why is the like why are there no br bridge carbons on the bottom of the structure like where the five four and three are labeled uh those are not connected those each have hydrogens on them okay so those are not uh those uh, if you can, if I redrew this as flat, let me redraw that as flat. We will actually have a six membered ring and this would be our one carbon or two carbon with a methyl group on it, three, four, and then we'll have one carbon linking the one and the four together. Okay. Does that perspective uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. So we, a lot of times we'll draw it from the side like this so you can see it's poking up or down. However, if you redraw it flat like this, it's sometimes hard to get all the carbons inside the ring, but you can do it. And that might, uh, that might help your perspective. Okay, thank you. Okay, so alkenes are just like hydrocarbons, except they can contain at least one double bond or a pi bond, okay? And that double bond has to connect two adjacent carbons, which means two carbons in your chain now have sp3 hybridization. Each one has a p orbital available to pi bond. Okay, so we have to have at least two carbons with p orbitals to give us that pi bond. Because we've changed our hybridization from sp3 hybridization to sp2 hybridization, we end up losing a total of two hydrogens for each double bond you add to your system, okay? So that changes the generalized formula to have a loss of those two hydrogens. Remember alkanes were CnH2n plus two. Well, alkenes also have that loss of at least two hydrogens to make that double bond, okay? And we said that that is part of this ene right here, this infix, ene tells us that we have at least one carbon-carbon double bond, okay? Ain is no carbon-carbon double bonds, and ein is a carbon-carbon triple bond. So when we're trying to figure out what the parent chain is, we must have the longest continuous chain that includes the pi bond, okay? That means both carbons of the double bond. Okay, so let's look at that a little bit. So here, if we wanted to, you know, label it as an alkane, uh, we would want to have the longest um, continuous chain would probably be this one right here, okay? Okay, but we have an alkene on the structure, so we can't use that longest continuous carbon as our parent. We have to include both carbons of the alkene. So that makes it start here, okay. That'll make us start numbering from this section here, and we could go this way or this way, but this way is one carbon longer, so that's the way in which we're gonna number it. And also, because we're naming the compound for the alkene, we wanna have the first carbon of the alkene on the lowest number possible. So in this case, we can actually start it with a number one because it's at the end of the chain, and we'll label it to three, and then this would be four, five, six, seven if we label to this side, four, five, six, seven, eight if we label to the other side. So that means we have octene as our main parent chain. So we have eight carbons in our parent chain with an alkene, so it's octene, okay? And then the remaining four carbons are now a substituent. So that substituent becomes our butyl, right here, okay, and we're gonna figure out the location for that. Okay, now, because that alkene does not necessarily have to be at the end of the chain, it could be anywhere in that chain, we have to locate where it is. And so we take the first carbon of the double bond that it, where it shows up on our chain and we include that number in the name. So that gives us octene right here, but we have to show where that, that that double bond is, so we're gonna say oc one ene, okay? So we have our oct for that, 
We have one telling us that the first carbon in our double bond is on that one carbon, and we have our octene. And because we know this is number one, this is number two, and this is number three, we now have three butyl, butyl dash, oct one -ene. Okay? So we're just adding that new rule to the system. If you have multiple double bonds, do you indicate all? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. For example, if I were to do, we actually have a different naming structure for this because we're going to call it a diene, okay? Double bond on a substituent. Um, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. Let me answer this one first. We actually have a different naming structure for this. This would be called a diene, and we would call it a 1,3 diene to answer your multiple bonds, and you do indicate where each of the starts of them are. Ah, for a substituent, okay? All right, so you would pick the longest chain with the highest number of double bonds in it. So for example, if we had something crazy like, um, let's do it here, uh, double bond, double bond, and then a double bond here, right? So this would still be our longest chain right here. We would label this as our parent chain and this is a substituent because you have one more double bond in your parent chain, okay? Actually, you would name it as, no, you would name it, this is your parent chain, it was the one containing all three of them. And then this would be your substituent here. So how can you have three, well, ah, maybe, hmm, there's gotta be, oh, I know. What if you had a compound that looked like this? All right, so one of them has to be a substituent, right? So we would name our longest chain first and have this as a vinyl, would be the common name for the substituent, or ethene. Eth Ethenol. Substituent. So you'd still name your longest chain possible, but you could still have a vinyl group as a substituent. Does that answer your question? Um, Professor Irving? Yes. Um, can you also name it as 3-butyl-1-octene? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, that like without putting the one in the ene, can you just put the one at the beginning? For, for this one right here or the original one? The original one. Uh, for the original one, um, there is a convention that says because you have one, you can do three butyl dash one dash octene, yes. That okay. is allowed. But if you put the one right before the alkene, there is no uh, ambiguity. So putting it right before the ene, it tells you it's absolutely positively right there. It's the best way to do it. All right, appreciate that. All right. So we're going to get into some of these multiple alkenes in a different name, no, nomenclature because we're going to add a certain level. They have a certain reactivity that we'll talk about in a later chapter. So we'll continue uh, on that. But the general idea would be longest chain first, and then you can have uh, double bond substituents if it's off of the main chain. Okay, so now that we have alkenes and we now have a possibility of what we call stereoisomers because they are fixed in space. With our hydrocarbons, they have free rotation around those sigma bonds and so you can redraw them a number of different ways and they're all right. Okay, here when we have that double bond, that pi bond, you don't have free rotation around that bond, that bond, which means you now can have your substituents fixed in space. So we have to take an account where they are in space, and we call that stereoisomers. So the simplest structure would have the alkene at the end, okay? Meaning you only have one R group attached to it, everything else is hydrogen, and we call that a monosubstituted alkene, and this is the general structure here. This chain can be as long as you want, okay? There's no uh, 
structural isomer for this. I mean, there's no uh, stereo isomer for this because there's no need for it because it's symmetrical in that way. Once we get two groups on there, we can actually attach those two groups in three different ways, okay? The first way is where we have both substituents on the same side of the double bond, okay? And then we have an opportunity to have the substituents on the, um, I mean, on the same bond here. These are both on the same side of an axis drawn through the double bond, okay? And we have a name for that when they're both on that same side of the double bond. And then we have an opportunity here to have it be where you have your R group on opposite sides of the line drawn by your double bond. We have a name for that. Now, if you add one more group, it gets a little more complex, and we have to have a rule to help us name that, and it has, and we'll get to that in a minute. But we have three different substituents here, and this is always, remember, you have a hydrogen left as the last one. And then you can actually have four different groups attached to your double bond here. And we have a way to name that as well. Okay. So let's talk about stereoisomers, okay? So stereoisomers just means that they are the same thing. They have all the same bonds and all the same uh, connections, except they have a different place in space, okay? So let's assume that these are methyl groups here. So if we actually drew the molecular structure for this, those two compounds would be identical, okay? But they're not identical because this one has both methyl groups on the same uh, side of the axis of that double bond, and this one has them on the opposite sides of that axis drawn by that double bond, okay? So when they're on the same side, we call that cis, or same side, and when, we, when they're on opposite sides, we call that trans isomerization. So you can imagine uh, it's, you know, uh, forming this, you know, chair-like structure, okay. So when, they, when we have two substituents, we can always use the cis and trans isomerization. Uh, and it's always because the other two groups tend to be hydrogen on each side. So if you have two substituents, easy to number. And you notice that these are in uh, italics here. So if these were both methyl groups, that would give us one, two, three, four carbons. So we would have butene, but because this would have to be our number one carbon and this would have to be our number two carbon, we would have two butene, okay? Or we would say bu two en as our name, but then we have to decide whether it's cis or trans. And if both of the methyl groups are on that same side of the double bond axis here, we would call that cis two butene or cis butene and trans butene. Now, the with the two in front of the alkene name is the most correct version of it. Although occasionally you'll see it in some books where the two's in front here, if it's a simple compound. Once the compounds get more complex, you must move it to right in front of the alkene. Okay, so that's for two things. Um, but we have different opportunities here, okay? So in the case of our substituent here, uh, we're gonna use this trans butene to indicate that they are on opposite sides of that axis here. We're gonna use the cis to say they're both on the same side of that axis. However, once we start doing more than that, the significance of cis and trans goes away. It occasionally can be the same if the two groups you're comparing are the largest groups and they are the same group, okay? So for example, if we have these examples here, right here, so we have a tri-substituted alkene, but we have two of the same group uh, on either side of the double bond. And so we can actually use the cis and trans configuration because 
They are cis and trans to the two largest groups, and they are the same group, okay? Because we're, yeah, and they're the same group. Now, in the case of this one here, we actually have four substituents, but our two largest groups are both three carbons long, and so that we're naming for this entire chain right here, and because the two longest groups are the same groups and on the same side, we can call them trans. Okay. Okay. So that gets kind of hard. We can actually do the cis and trans isomerization for tri substitute and tetra substitute, but we have another naming system to be even more precise. Okay. To be more precise about it, we have what we call the E and Z terminology. <coughs> so with E and Z, it works great if you have a tri-substituted or a tetra-substituted alkene, and it doesn't even have to be substituted with a hydrocarbon. We can have any group possible, and we can use this uh, con engel prelog system, or the CIP system, to identify whether or not the material is in which configuration. Okay. So because we have this E and Z, they're based on German words. Okay. Uh, E is engagen, uh, meaning opposite, and Z is zusammen, meaning same, or the uh, same side. So the way to remember that is Z, if Z groups are on Z same side, it is Z, okay? So uh, that's uh, how I remember it. But so if we're looking at it, uh, E is, a, is analogous to trans, Z is analogous to cis. However, the reason they're only analogous is because we're looking at things that are tri and tetra substitute. Okay, so let's figure out how we assign E and Z. So instead of saying the longest chain or the groups themselves, we're looking at the highest priority substituent. Okay, what do we mean by highest priority? Okay, a highest priority is something that has the highest molecular weight, I'm sorry, the highest uh, molecular uh, atomic number, okay? We use atomic number because there's a couple things that actually don't match molecular weight-wise, so it's the highest atomic number. Okay, so let me show you the, how, to, how to do this, okay? So the key in finding E and Z is you actually have to look at both sides of the double bond along going across the double bond right here, okay? Because remember, cis and trans were whether or not they're on the same side this way or opposite sides this way, right? So we have to look at it as what is the highest priority group on this side of the double bond? And then we have to look at what the highest priority group is on this side of the bond, okay? Now remember, priority goes by atomic number. Epicent, that's a good one too, I like that. Uh, so, uh, so on this side, let's go to the, the simple side here. We have carbon and we have hydrogen. Hydrogen is atomic number one, carbon is atomic number six. That means this is the highest priority on this side of the molecule. Okay, we're done with that side of the molecule. Now we assign the highest priority to the other side of the double bond, okay? So in this case, we have bromine and we have oxygen. Oxygen is atomic number eight. Bromine is much higher than that. <laughs> I don't know the exact number, it's not 35, it's 48, no, it's higher than that. I don't remember. But it is higher, so that makes this the highest priority on this side, okay? So now we have assigned priority on each side of that double bond. Now, are the two things highest priority on the same side or are they on different sides, okay? In this case here, the two atoms of highest priority are on the same axis side. So the same axis side, they're both on this axis of the double bond, just like when we were assigning cis and trans. And because they're both on that same side, that gives us a Z determination, Z zane side. And if they were on opposite sides, it would be opposite sides, E. 
Okay. So let's do another one of those just to see. Okay. I'm um, sorry. Now, what if we start with something and we move, we've divided our molecule in half along that double bond and we're starting to assign priority to either side and we end up with the same atom. Like they both have carbons. Okay. Well, now we have to go, hmm, those can't, uh, we, we can't assign priority over either one of those because they're the same. We have to go out to the next atom that it's bonded to. Okay. And so we start going out further and further until we get a winner for the system. So let's show you how that works, okay? So if we do this molecule instead of the molecule we had before, and we, add, we took that hydrogen off and we added this propyl chain here, okay, and we still have an oxygen and a bromine on this side. So on this half of the molecule, we've already assigned this as our number one priority. This is our priority group here, okay? Now we have to assign the other side of the group. So the first thing we do is we go and say, oh, well, let's see what is our first atom here. And we have carbon and we have carbon. Ah, oh, those are the same. Hmm. Okay, I can't make a decision yet, okay? So let's go out one more atom, carbon and carbon, okay? Okay, still can't make a decision because they're still carbons and they still have the same number of hydrogens on them. But this one, has a carbon and three hydrogens attached to it. This carbon has two hydrogens and another carbon. Okay, so now we've gone out that third bond before we found a difference. But we now have a difference, therefore we now have a priority. This one has one extra carbon on it, which makes this side our priority on this side of the molecule is on here. So, if bromine is our priority on that side of the molecule and this longer carbon chain is priority on this side of the molecule, what does that make this structure? Anybody? Marcy, you still have your hand raised, by the way. Z. Okay, they are on the same side, so they are Z. So that is correct. Okay, so. The key about alkenes is you need that alkene or all the alkenes in the longest chain possible. Because you don't have free rotation around that double bond, we can have isomers and they are called stereoisomers. And we have cis and trans with two substituents or identical substituents. And we have a method for assigning priority to give us E and Z, okay? Now, if you have three substituents or more, E and Z is always more accurate than the cis and trans, okay? So uh, three or more, try to always assign it with an E or a Z. Okay, so now we had alkenes, right? We started with alkanes. Now let's move on to having a hydrocarbon chain with three different, um, um, with, a, with a triple bond in it, okay? So, Anytime you have a carbon chain with a double bond, you have an opportunity to uh, rehybridize those sp2 hybridized carbons to an sp1 hybridized carbon. And now you'll have two p orbitals on each of those carbons. One of those p orbitals is gonna overlap in one axis, and one of them is gonna overlap in an axis that is 90 degrees off the other p. That's how we get three bonds. The first bond is the sigma bond, the second bond is the first pi bond, and the third bond is the second pi bond. And so when we have these three, uh, this triple bond, it's different than having two double bonds, and therefore we change the nature of the species, and we call it an alkyne, the YN here, okay? The alkynes are ever, anything that has a parent chain with a double bond in it, or triple bond in it, okay. So just like before, our parent chain is always the longest chain. It includes both carbons of the triple bond. So when we go through that naming structure, we do the same. And just like with alkenes, we try to assign it to the smallest number possible, and we locate that first bond of the triple bond as our uh, position in our name. So in this case here, we have one, 
So we would have eight, let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Even though the longest hydrocarbon chain is 10 carbons long, we can't use it because we have a double or triple bond. So we have to start labeling from this side. Right here. And so that gives us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total. So that gives us octane right there. And then we have a substituent hanging off on the three carbon. So that gives us three butyl as our substituent. So let's bring it all together and locate where that uh, first bond of the um, uh, uh, alkyne was and go three butyl, oc, one, one ine. Okay, so the oct comes from the fact that we have the eight carbons in the longest chain. Our substituent is a substituent, and we've located exactly where the triple bond is. Okay, so we haven't really added any rules. We've just added a new functional group to play with it, and we make sure that we use the an an to signify that it's an alkyne. Okay, so that's simple if you only have one. <laughs> Now, what if you have multiple, and we had that question before, what if you have multiple double bonds or triple bonds, okay? So, if you're in the case of having the multiple double bonds, you can actually use the di, tri, tetra to signify how many double bonds you have or how many triple bonds you have in that column, okay? But you still have to locate where they are by putting the number of the first carbon, once you've started labeling it, that the number assigned to the first part of the double bond or the first part of the triple bond. Okay. So, let's go ahead and look at how to do that. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to find our longest chain containing both triple bonds. And in this case, we could go uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So now we have hepta diine, okay? So we have diine because we have two, um, two, two triple bonds, okay? Now we have to label it such that the first substituent, uh, so that we have the, the first double bond has the lowest number possible, okay? So instead of labeling it from this side, which would give us our substituent the lowest number, we actually have to label it from this side, giving us our alkyne the lowest number. So we're gonna number it from that lowest alkyne going through here. So that means we can now name our substituents, okay? Because now we have one, two, this is our three carbon, we have a methyl group, and we have a six carbon with a methyl group. We can do three comma six dimethyl, Okay, so we've done that, that's all right. We have a total of seven carbons, so that's hepta. But now we have to identify where each and every uh, triple bond is. And so in this case, it's one and four. So that gives us one, four, di, i. Okay, so the complete name is the three, six, dimethyl, hepta, one, four, di, i. So, you might notice that I always break it down and do section by section by section, and I do it in a specific order. That's the way nomenclature works best, right? You find your longest parent chain, you write that down. Then you start getting the number system right, you write that down. Then you start adding the substituents, you write that down, and then you add all of them together to get your correct name, okay? You don't, you know, and the reason we do that is because let's say uh, you, you have different types of substituents. Well, you want to write their position down to make sure you have them associated with like the 2-ethyl group or the 7-methyl, but you're going to have to alphabetize them anyway. So if you put all the different parts down and then do that last step of alphabetizing and getting them all on the same line, you're going to come up with the right answer most of the time. Okay. 
let's see. I think that's actually fine. Okay. I'm going to do this last rule and then we're going to break for the weekend here. Okay. So alkenes and alkynes are kind of one of these weird things in which because the alkene and the alkyne are both important in the naming structure, we have to actually have them both in our parent chain. And when we do that, we actually identify them as an enine. Okay. So you have an alkene and an alkyne in the parent chain. And so we actually, because it's it tells us, the ene tells us there's a double bond in the main chain, and the ine tells us there's a triple bond somewhere in there, we have to use both of them if they are both present. So in the case of this system here, the ene comes first. So whenever we find the alkene, we want to think of the alkene coming first because we labeled alkenes before we labeled alkynes. And then alkynes come next. So we always label it with an ene first, then the ine next, okay? So in this example here, we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons, okay? And because the ene comes first, we have to label the ene with the lowest number possible. So that gives us our labeling from this side to two, three, four, five, right here. And we now have a way to number our system. So now we have seven carbons, heptene, ine, because we have a double bond and triple bond. We have to identify where the alkene is. It's on our two carbon, hept two ene. Our alkyne is on our five carbon, five ine. Okay, ah, but we have a di substituted alkene. We have to assign cis or trans. If we draw our axis right here, we have one on one side and one on the other, which gives us our trans configuration. Okay. So this is a great place to stop. It's a complex rule, but notice how they just build on each other. We did enes first. Enes had to have the lowest number. Eines were after that. En, ein, number the en first, number the ein second. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop recording, and if you have questions, hang back and we can answer them.